a great meeting point, convenient light meals, hot and cold beverages, or a quick snack on the go, what's your order for the day? We don't just say, we do. It's the Stain City Way. Welcome to Real Talk with me, Anel M. Dodda. Today we bring you a gospel artist who made history just this past weekend by becoming the first gospel artist to fill up the dome with a gathering of over 20,000 worshippers. Dumi Sang Makwea is not just a doctor in theology as many would assume. Dr. Dumi is a qualified medical doctor who always had the nudging sense that he could do more than heal people physically. He could also heal them by getting into their hearts. Being blessed with a voice and an anointing has fed him very well. Today is a multi-platinum selling gospel sensation and a chart-topping artist winning over 12 awards in 2016 for his album Love and Grace. He earned his title Who Babes Will Count Gospel Awards with a whopping nine nominations and earlier this year he was nominated three times at the Salmas, one of them being for Best Male, Best Male Artist of the Year. The good doctor indeed has the heart of a king. Please we welcome Dr. Dumi to Real Talk. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be here, finally. Listen, listen. I feel like this is the good life. <laughs> this is the good life, ne? You, 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 the other side, ne? Yeah, the other side. Um, Too much. Listen, your fan base, eh? Yeah. Yeah, I'm scared of them. I'm a little scared of them. <laughs> we, we, all we did was post a picture. Hey, look, yeah. Dr. Tumi is coming. There must have been thousands of people. We're tuning in. <laughs> we love him. We, they're yeah. hectic. They're amazing. Um, and I think that's why a lot of things have been happening because of them. They, yeah. Um, they're there all the time. I, I take them as family because of course. Um, they're there for me, man. Like, really there. And, and you promised them so much because... <laughs> I promised, promised them so them. much. This is what you tweeted. You said, Tolukuti, I can dance. I just choose <laughs> not to because me, I'll bring the house down. And then I understand it because one of us Yeah, yeah. So yeah. basically, I mean, I, I grew up in Petersburg for two yeah. years of my life. Is it? Oh, we can dance wow. there in Petersburg. Yeah, but I can't. Oh, so you, you, you were um, not telling the truth? No, 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 no. I, I really struggle to dance. It's one of those <laughs> things that um, I'm hopeless. I can't hear, I hear the beat. Uh, it doesn't get to the feet. Oh, that, that rhymes, just it, by the it way. It really doesn't get there. I hear the beat, it just doesn't get to the feet. It's <laughs> it a proper explanation. It doesn't. Um, so I, I try not to. I do everything not to dance. But speaking of feet, mm. you played soccer at a provincial level. I did. I did. Um, so there's something you can do with your feet. Yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> uh, the coordination for playing soccer and for dancing is totally different Oh, what? Oh, what? The Brazilians beg to differ. Okay. Yeah. Well, Brazilians. Uh, I struggle, man. I, 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 I tried doing, at a point, um, what do they call it? I did the rumba and the samba, ah. and um, I took dance lessons. Oh. I was so terrible. <laughs> it was Latin. I did Latin, Latin dance. dancing. Yeah, so I did it for about six months. Oh, you stuck in there? Yeah, I, 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 I tried. I just never went beyond it. The training phase, so to one, competition. Yeah, it was one, two, one. and then I decided, you know what, this looks silly now. Uh. I'm gonna leave, and I stopped. <laughs> you, you must be one of the most talented people, because as I was like reading up about you, I was yeah. like, you know, where you like South Africa's Justin Bieber, right? Because yeah. Justin Bieber could have played, uh, like, you know, international hockey. Yeah. He's that good, international ice hockey. He's really good at it, yeah. but he chose to sing. Yeah. With you, the, you know, you're an academic, <laughs> you're yeah. a doctor. You are a really anointed singer, and then also yeah. you're good at soccer. I mean, looking at those three paths, why did you, you choose the paths you chose at the time that you did? Yeah. Um, I moved from um, one school to another, and they didn't have soccer. So I stopped playing soccer. There was rugby. I went there one day, just mm. one day. Mm. What a scrum. And, man, I didn't even know the rules. I didn't know you can't throw the, the ball forward. forward. Yeah. I was doing all the silly things, and I just felt silly. I thought, you know what? Rugby is not for me. I tried basketball for a bit. Um, I tried swimming. I was, was really, I sucked ah, at what swimming. Swimmer? I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I can't compete at any level. And I decided, you know what? Um, then I joined the choir. And the choir did not 
really do much at that school. It was, we just had a couple of rehearsals. And, uh, uh, so I just stuck to my music at home and my school, really. Mm. I stopped sports at that point. And um, I think it was when I completed metric, when I was actually doing my metric, because I'd, I'd been involved in a lot of musical stuff at that point. So you knew you could church. sing? I was playing at church, I was writing. started writing at a very young age. Yeah. Uh, my dad bought me my first keyboard when I was nine, when I was just about to turn nine. Uh, and I started playing at church at that point, started a couple of groups along the way. My first group well, was called- No, no, Is that no. long afterwards? No, that's long oh. afterwards. That, I was in varsity when we started yeah. in dance. Um, my first group was me, my brother, and two other friends, Prince and Kia. Why are you embarrassed by the name? The name, I think of it now, I'd never, <laughs> I'd never, I'd never use that name. It's called The Mighty Singers. Oh, okay. Um, it doesn't ring nice to my ears now. Like, the Mighty Singers, <laughs> like the Mighty Ducks, what's wrong? No, I think it was, it was more influenced by the Mighty Clouds of Joy and, oh. and the Mighty Singers just felt wrong at some point. I thought, okay, I'm not gonna be part of this. And we started a couple of groups and we were doing a lot of weddings. I played a lot, a lot of gigs, man, like free gigs. Uh. Like everybody who was getting married at church, I was there. Nearly our perfect wedding before. <laughs> before. <laughs> I'm sure I'd be appearing on a lot of, a lot of shows. But, but yeah, I really enjoyed it. I think that for me was my first initial platforms of uh, singing in front of different crowds. So I understand your dad yeah. always wanted you to, you know, to be a doctor and an academic. Yeah. So then why did he buy you a keyboard at age nine if he didn't want you to go down that path? I'm glad he did. I think he, he, he kind of figured that I really like it. Because uh. what happened is they bought an organ for the church and um, they put it at home because they needed to just put some security measures at church so that it's not sold. We started fiddling at, at, at home with my brothers and you know, and my brothers were already in varsity, so they left and I was left with it. So I started playing and I put more effort into it and they had to then take it to church. Mm -hmm. But by that time I was already playing at home, cell meetings, you know, and my dad kind of figured, okay, let me just get him a keyboard. So you taught I don't yourself? Think, yeah, uh, yeah, I did, I did, I self-taught. And um, I taught a couple of other people after that who plays really a hundred times better than I do. But um, he kind of realized that perhaps let me get him something that would just keep him busy. I think initially that, that, that's what it was. But he also could see that maybe there's something there. You can you see know? my face is in <laughs> oh, right? Because you say you taught yourself how to play the piano, like someone would be like, yeah, I pulled my yeah. own tooth out with the thread <laughs> in the door. <laughs> I did, I did. I, I just learned to fiddle and um, I figured out a couple of chords and then yeah. spread that out, started listening to a lot of music and learning and started playing. And I think playing at church really taught me a lot because yeah. I was playing on the spot. Like any song that comes, like you need you to follow figure the melody. out where to go. So learned a lot of melodies at that point. Uh, so a lot of musical training was just church, okay. just church. Listen, this may be me doing the interview, but I know you are out there and there are many <laughs> of you that have got questions and comments of praise for Dr. Dumi. Tweet us, hashtag Real Talk with Anele or send through your 20 second voice notes to the number that you see on the screen right now. We'll try to be back really quickly. <laughs> So our guest this afternoon, Dr. Dumi, has made incredible strides in the gospel industry right from the time he decided to answer his other calling to make spiritual music. Yeah. So many tweets coming through. I told you about your fan base. Uh, <laughs> at Tulu Fellow says, the reason why fans love him is because he makes time for his fans. He is extremely humble. Bazalana, Toluku to Dr. Dumi is on the show. <laughs> I do love you, people. Man. You love people, ne? I do. And I think that's why I ended up doing medicine because I always wanted to serve people. Mm. So that was training in itself because I did a, a couple of years in that before I went into the music again. Mm. Uh, and by then I'd learned that you always look after lives, you know, and it's a good lesson to learn. So when you deal with people at whatever level, because mm. you do a bit of, of counseling, you yeah. do uh, almost everything if you're a GP, because I'm a GP. Um, so. Um, you learn that it's important to maintain relationships. It's important to um, connect with people yeah. so that they can be free to connect to, with you. So I, I, I do a lot of that because I think uh, I just love people. Yeah. <laughs> They're important. You, so you when become you took what you that, are because that, of that them. Yeah. Oath to be a doctor, you kind of spread it over to your music then. 
Yeah, yeah. You know? I, I, I took it and I applied in every part of my life that, you know, lives are important. Take, yeah. take, do not take anyone lightly. So the beauty is you get to treat people who are um, um, previously disadvantaged, people who have nothing, people who have a lot at the yeah. same time, and you need to do it the same. I know I have, I have a friend who's a, who's a GP and you, yeah. you, you're just reminding me about something that he said. He said that as a GP, when, when yeah. you're speaking to a patient, yeah. you, can't, you mustn't speak past them. Just no. want to solve what they came to fix. Yeah. Because if you talk to them, you'll find out that this is actually the last 500 that they're spending yeah. on you. And at times, you'll find that you'll give them back their money and be like, yeah, Zimbabwe, keep your money. That happens all the time. I, th I think the moment you start connecting, um, that's why you need to debrief when you get home. Because uh. uh, you carry a lot of those people home problems and you're always dealing with something and and it can get really uh strenuous heavy. sometimes and heavy. heavy on you yeah you get home you don't even know why am i feeling so bad why am i so down um, but some of the most pleasant moments is when that person comes back and say thank you so much this was precious you helped me i didn't even have money to come and consult and they bring gifts like you always get get gifts you get and it could be little things it mm. could be uh a couple of apple apples that they bring oh, to you or, or like whatever. Or like they bake you bread. Or, and, and or they slaughtered a chicken for you. <laughs> and if I would foil. Yeah. <laughs> Can you see I'm hungry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, but you learn to love people. Uh, and, and, and once you're in that space where you, you, your heart just wants to serve, uh, it, it's a strange feeling when people want to do things for you. Uh, so um, it's a bit... It, it hits you hard. Oh, like, so is it difficult for you to accept? Because you're so used to giving. It hits you so hard. It hits you so hard every time. And I think that's why I always feel like I must do more. I must do more because I feel like I'm the one that should be doing. Ah. I'm the one that should be giving. And, um, but you, you get to appreciate that you also at times need to receive. And, mm. and in the beginning, it was difficult to even just receive compliments. Like when a person say that, I feel like, oh... Uh, but oh, you stop. get. <laughs> no, but, no. But, but I actually realized it's it's a level of false humility. Oh. You need to accept people when people are excited about you and take that in and say thank you very much. Be genuine about yeah. it, of course. Um, you don't need to always feel like um, uh, they're saying something that is undeserved. Yeah. And um, so take it in. Um, if you're gifted in that place, why you're not? You're gifted. That's a yeah. that's a gift from God. True. So how do you debrief then when you get home? I, I, actually, let me rephrase that. Yeah. What is the difference between the way you debrief when you were a doctor and yeah. the way you debrief now as a singer? I don't debrief now. No, I, I, I totally love what I'm doing. I connect with people 24-7, uh, and you know, and you get, you still get people who send you um, inboxes that you feel like, I wish I could do more. And they tell you a sad story. Mm. But I love that in most cases, you also get good testimony. Somebody say, you know what? I almost killed myself mm. and I didn't, I got encouraged by a song and that is priceless, man. It's one of those things that it's more precious than money. Mm. It's more precious than fame. Mm. Uh, it's for somebody to come back to you and say, you changed my life. So why stop medicine? And was it like no, a I couldn't difficult cope. No, it, wasn't, it wasn't difficult at all. I couldn't cope. I, I was at the practice and I would leave six, seven every day, get home. I have tons of work to do, claims and uh, processing of- Medical aid. Yeah, administrations. And that was a lot of work on weekends. Like at that point, I was doing four or five gigs. Every, like it was like hectic weekends. Oh, so you were doing both? I was doing both. So I was away during the week. I was away during the weekends. And my weekends were hectic, I'd be doing outside gigs from Thursday till Sunday, mm. every weekend. And started going late to work and I knew that there's something, that something is kicking in that I don't even understand. We start getting to work at one, because you're so tired. Like my Mondays, without even discussing with myself, mm. I would wake up, sit and feel like I just need a break. And mm. I'll get to the practice. And I actually felt it's starting to be unfair to the patients because mm. You get to the office, hey, it's me. packed. Like when you walk in, you feel like, oh, it's gonna be a long day. And I just knew that, you know what, I can't carry on like that, because in one instance, I'm making them wait. Mm. But the other problem is I walk in there, I get depressed just as I walk in, because already I'm thinking it's gonna be a long day. But I mean, you're a doctor, why am I shy, trippy, revive? <laughs> no, man. <laughs> <laughs> do 
January. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I'm with Dr. Tumi in studio today. Don't move a muscle. We'll be right back with your voice notes. And you said you'd never leave. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. You are here. And you said you'd never leave. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We. So Dr. Tumi, inspired by Abu Philip himself, Caspar Nyoves, fulfilled his dream of filling up the dome on the 20th of August. Uh, if you see the images, it looked absolutely breathtaking. And the live concert DVD will be out very soon, so you can buy it. Uh, later, you're going to tell us about the, the, the story yeah. about the dome where there were yeah. people waiting outside yeah. Yeah. and it was too packed. I want to hear about it. But at Simply Tepi on Twitter wants to yeah. know, Anele, please, I just want to meet him. Yo. <laughs> There's a yo there, I'm not making it up. Uh, please ask him when he'll be coming to Mahi Um Later this year. Actually, I was supposed to go uh, three weeks ago. Yeah, and then the concert was cancelled. So oh. uh, we're making up for it. So okay. we definitely will go to Mahi So you feel like uh, yeah, Tepi is making up for it, not to you personally, but <laughs> to Mahi King. Stand by, he'll be there. Uh, please well, the you... promoters are making up for the it because it wasn't my watching. event. Yeah, so. uh, just a request, please stop calling the WhatsApp line. Just send WhatsApp voice notes because now we can't get to the... You're not going to speak to him. He doesn't have a phone on him. He's not going to answer and be like, hey, talk that to me here. How can I help you? Where's your pain? How can I heal? Send your WhatsApp voice notes. Trust me, we'll put it on. Here's the first one. Please, Dr. Tumi, can I ask you, because I see potential. If you were to sing R&B and soul, would you, would you go for it? Would you go for it other than gospel? No, no, I, you know what? I don't have a problem with it. Um, I think everybody's called to do something. Mm. And there's somebody that's already in that space that's called to do that. Mm. Um, I feel I'll be trying to be somebody I'm not or to do what I'm not called to do. Because you can write. Yeah, I can write. I mean, I've written love songs. I've written, um, mm. uh, I can write anything if you just give me a theme, basically. But I choose to do this because I, I believe this is my calling. Mm -hmm. And this is how I'm supposed to um, uh, give out to society. And, and I do what I believe I'm called for. Mm. So, yeah, maybe in another life, <laughs> I'll come back as an R&B singer. I don't know. But when you came off stage at the Dome, yeah. you repeatedly said that this makes me believe that nothing is impossible. Absolutely. Uh, except singing R&B. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nearly dot, dot, dot. Except singing R&B. Okay, no, but, I But I, I do believe that. I, don't be I believe... You can do anything you like. Mm. If you put your mind to it, if you just see it in your... I'll tell you how my story started. I think I have a problem of dreaming beyond what other people mm. accept. And I scare a couple of people when I, when I start sharing my dreams. Uh, but my dad is one of those people that has always thought you can dream. It's big it doesn't as matter. And he actually gave me a scripture for it. Mm. And I remember it. it is, I'll never forget it. It's in Genesis 13. 14 to 17. In a nutshell, it says, look to the north, south, east, west, however far your eyes can see that I've given to you. 
that scripture stuck to me, man. And I always think of it whenever I'm supposed to do something. If I can see it in my, my heart, in my spirit, if I can capture that, I don't know why it shouldn't be done because mm. it's as good as done. Just me believing it can be done. That's where it starts. So is that why the dome happened? Because you believed it can be done? Absolutely believe you can do way more mm. than the dome. I think it's a starting point. Um, I, I've never had a dream to, if, if for the lack of a better word, um, uh, to um, conquer South Africa. I've never had that. Mm. That's never been my dream. My dream has always been the world. I've always thought um, I want to write music that will reach all nations of the world. Uh, I've never thought if I make it in South Africa, I'm content. No. Because uh, my main purpose was to reach people mm. with a certain message. And they needed as much in Kenya as they needed in South Africa. As much as they needed in the UK. Absolutely. As in Japan. So I wanted to do that. That's always been my dream. So when I do things local, they encourage me to know that, okay, it's a good starting point. Um, I'm launching from here and then I'll spread to the rest of the, which we're doing now. Um, got an international distribution deal with Universal uh, and we'll be spreading our music internationally. Mm. But I'm doing an international tour as well, going to the UK, the US and Australia. But even that does not really explain where it is you want to be? I am in my mind already. So, so it doesn't really scare me. I'm grateful when I get to a certain point. Yeah. But I know that but this is not it. Yeah. This is, there's more to, to life than where I am right now. There's more people to reach. Yeah. I want to be able to change lives beyond in conversation. Mm -hmm. I want somebody to come and say, he paid my bills. He paid for my house. He, that's where I want to get. And for that, I need to do what I need to do uh, to be able to afford to do that for people. And yeah, so we started a foundation, so. Yeah, okay. Uh, and and uh, the purpose now is to, uh, I think one of the things I, I have a heart for is, is girls who don't have sanitary towels. I think uh -huh. that's. Is that is that the drive the, now? Yeah, no, I, I really want to make sure that nobody feels embarrassed and class or wherever because yeah. they didn't have. Yeah. So building, I can do one step at a time, one school at a time, but you must do something to give back to society and to make somebody's life. They must wake up and think. That guy did it for that me. That guy, man, helped me, man. You said your brother came to you backstage to say, okay, we're ready to go. Is yeah. your family, your, are they like your team? Are they? The yeah, they're oh. very involved. They're very involved. My wife is very involved in it. Yeah. Uh, she's my manager as well. So they- she's like yeah, she's that girl. She's that girl. <laughs> she's that girl, yeah. and and uh, she she comes in and she'll tell me, okay, this is good. We're ready as well. And she uh, she's been involved in the whole process. So she's the first person I bother with anything. Mm. I'll tell her, and uh, if she says, I I think it can be done. I have more peace than anywhere else because I'm gonna have to deal with her <laughs> throughout the case. process. Yeah. So, so I tell her first, in most instances, that I'm thinking this. And I think if there ever there was a point in her life that she used to get scared, at this point she knows I go for what I believe. So she doesn't get scared anymore. She's just also in the space that I am. So we talk and we just get it done. And um, people will call. You, you always get messages that it can't be done. Mm. I promise you. It's, it's the strangest thing. Um, you'll get it from people who have not tried it. Yeah. And, and, and so I learned to to build this wall um, to anything that says you can't. And that helps. And I listen to people who have done it because they will never come to you and say it can't be done. It can't be done, especially if they've so, done it. No, I mean, Casper sent me a message and said, I believe you're gonna do it. And I tell you, it had so much weight than just a random word because he had done it, mm. you know? So um, somebody who's been there, who's seen um, the challenges, who's been through the whole process and got there and still got it done. When they say it, you, you get stared up. So Dr. Dumi sings songs of healing, praise, and inspiration, hoping to change lives one melody at a time in the tough times that we live in. Show him some love on Twitter and on WhatsApp. We'll see you right after the break. My side. The enemy would have swallowed us 
would have drowned in their waters but our souls have found an escape a hiding place in you the fowler snake is broken our help is in the name of the Lord no nothing without you without you you only that I bring can live without you without you Jesus Are you not sold? Are you not sold? That was yet another offering. Uh, with what, what is this one called? Uh, this, co this song is called uh, Nothing, Nothing Without, Without You. It's from yeah. my, uh, my, the first album I put into stores, which is Love and Grace. Yeah, but then you re-released Love and Grace. No, I re-released Heart of a King, which is oh. the first album I recorded. I didn't have anyone to distribute it, so I just kept it in the boot. And then I decided, you know what? A couple of years later, I decided, let me do another album. Oh. Perhaps this will work. I put that out and nobody wanted it after I recorded it as well. So, What was they it, saying is wrong? Because I mean, it's I too get contemporary. Not um, it won't work in the country. People will not buy this music, make it traditional. Um, nobody's ever done it. And I, I thought, oh, yeah, I've done it. Let me just put up some video on YouTube. And I did. And a couple of weeks later, I was starting to get a couple of calls because it was already um, circulating. circulating. And we put it into the stores um, in May last year did gold in two months, that month we had platinum, um, two, three, four months later we went double platinum. I, I, then I re-released the first album that yeah. I had recorded. Of course we re-recorded it again. Yeah. Um, that's the, um, the one that they were playing there, yeah. the, other, the other song from. And you, you, and I mean, when we're watching that video, I said to you, for that to be your first DVD means that yeah. you're always thinking way ahead of time because the quality there is insane. Yeah, so that was recorded in 2015. And I also, I also believe that you must make people see the value in buying your, your product. Oh. I get tired watching some of the, the, the gospel yeah. videos. Um, in the all of them, justice. <laughs> I, so I, I, they don't spark any interest yeah. for me. So I wanted to do something that somebody would think, wow, this, I feel like I'm in the place. Mm. Even the DVD itself, they can buy it. So that was the purpose of, of really, I just believe in excellence and quality. So really? do you have your songs on your own playlist and when you're in your car, it's on shuffle there? No. Um, I listen to them so long in, in, in preparation. Uh. And I mean, we do, for that album, we had six months of rehearsals. By Ooh. the time that the album was out, I was tired of the songs myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I don't listen to them only then. <laughs> then I listen post-production because yeah. we fix some things. Then, I, then we send it to the States after that to get mixed in the States. Mm. I'm the first one to get the songs back and I must listen. I must listen to what I like, what I don't like, send it back. By the time it hits the shelves, I'm thinking, oh. But I must say, when I first had it on radio, I thought, ooh, this song is nice. I was excited. <laughs> You're like, who is this person here? <laughs> I, I said, who is this? Yeah, and I this. thought, I like it. And I do listen to them I, once in a while. Um, my kids love it. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, they get in the car and they're the bosses and they'll tell you which song to play. And I'll play that and listen to it. But um, I prefer to be quiet on the road. Because mm. I'm doing so much music. There's so much noise. When I'm and driving, good noise, but noise. When I'm driving, I don't switch on the radio. I don't switch on. I just want to listen, hear myself breathe. Um, and that helps me to 
just get time to relax because my life is a bit hectic. So, mm. uh, and when I'm sitting, I'm talking to people, I'm tweeting. You do your Facebook. own social media, ne? Yeah, I do. I do. I intentionally decided to do it, and I know a lot of people are like, get somebody to manage. I'm like, these people are looking for me, yeah. and I have minutes to to spare, so I do it myself. I actually talk to people and I inbox people when they do, and I try to respond to as many. And sometimes it is oh, it is a lot, because you put a post and it's got five, six, seven hundred comments. How when do you get the time? Yeah. Like, but I'll definitely you like it. each and every one of them at least. So uh, one last voice note. Let's hear it. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Anile. I would like to know, as a young person, academics comes first, right? As our parents preach. But then there's also another side to academics. There's music. So what would your advice be to a person who wants to pursue a career in music, but also wants to become a lawyer? Thank you. I think you can do anything. You can, um, education grounds you to a lot of degrees. You, you learn to um, manage even your life, you know? I've learned, like I said, uh, medicine has contributed a lot to my music mm. and how I deal with people. Mm. And um, I always say to people, get education. Even if you get trained in music, but get mm. trained, get, get a qualification mm. in whatever you wanna do. I, I did medicine because I wanted to help people within that space. And um, I'm not musically trained. Um, I had to learn things along the way. I could have probably done things much easier if had I also been, been musically trained. Okay. Not complaining with how I do things. Because there's I an think, essence, there's a raw yeah. essence that you don't want to get rid of. Yeah, um, but do get education. It is important, it does help. Uh, and it does give you a bit of weight in terms of how people relate to you, even when you're doing something else. Mm. Uh, it doesn't feel like, uh, and, then, and then he just decided to. So this to, is a fluke. Yeah, this is a mm. fluke, so. And also, and, I mean, she says, yeah. Music and law. Become a lawyer, man. You can do your own contracts. Become you can see from a mile away that someone's stealing from you. Like, ah, and, ah, you can, ah, and then you can ah, even become our lawyers because yes. we're not lawyers, you know? Yeah. And when we're on tour together, you come in with your band, <laughs> mine, and I have legal issues. I'm going to talk to you. Can I, can I leave this gig? Okay, I'm uh, <laughs> Yes, of course. But so. if somebody gets sick on the road, I, I would know what to do, mm. you know? Um, so it does add value to your life. But... What I would say is it must be something you love. Mm -hmm. uh, find what you really love and what your purpose is and, and study to become better at it. And um, that way you don't live a life of regret. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it, how would I be feeling now in private practice had I not pursued this career? Well, you'd be wrapping up your surgery now. Yeah, and I'll be going back to files and files and... To do medical aid claims and everything. So. I'm, I'm glad I'm doing this. I absolutely am. I'm, it's more fulfilling mm. um, to be here now. Mm. Um, Look, I, I get that it's fulfilling for you, but I don't think you understand the, the way you are fulfilling to everybody else, your fan yeah. base, and to everyone that is, you know, just like that absorbs your product. Please, yeah. can you thank your wife and your kids and your family for sharing you with us? Oh, they're amazing. And I think they are a group of people that I leave the most yeah. and, and whose time I always compromise. Yeah. But I make time, I make time, I really make time for my family. She's there all the time. Fortunately, she's my manager, so she, yeah. she gets to experience. I took the kids to the dope. I hardly take them to a lot of my concerts, but I thought you have to be there for this one. And there's a picture that somebody took. Uh, it was a random picture that uh, somebody posted. Mm. It was my son, like, and his hands were like, oh. <laughs> And I'm thinking, he doesn't even know. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so much you. for your time. You Thank are, you so much. You, uh, right? Uh, what, what more must I say? I don't have to tell you guys what his Twitter handle is, because you know, <laughs> after the break, we talk to internationally acclaimed photographer Zanele Moholi, who's here to tell us about her groundbreaking exhibition at the iconic Constitution Hill. Also, another science inventor that will wow you. Today is really all about excellence. You don't want to miss this. Stay with us. And welcome back. I'm now joined by Muholi, a daring artist whose group exhibition celebrates the work of women activist photographers. Welcome to the show. So, Muholi, that's it's very like law firm, private school boys where we call each other by our <laughs> surnames. Eh? <laughs> We're trying to break the gender thing, but otherwise, you're on track. Has it always been your 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 purpose to break the you know the gender stereotypes that South Africa is heavily under? Um, yeah, I think it's the right 
thing to do because it basically says nobody needs to be protected or be saved, you know. When once somebody call it by your first name, it's like, okay, somebody needs to be saved here because a female being is in, in, is in place. Is in, is in the yeah, space. no, no, no. So we say, holy, holy, which means leader, and mm -hmm. I'm leading and paving the way. Okay, so let's talk about your art exhibition. Um, I know that which you, one I know well I want to talk about let's first talk about the one that's uh, that was in, in Netherlands right at State okay. Museum it's still on it's still on yes how does that come about do you call them do they call you <laughs> uh, no I happen to receive a call I don't have to apply for a job I have worked enough already so I receive invitations mm. and then respond wherever possible so what what do you would you ever say no to something definitely when what? it sounds dodgy, I definitely have to say no. And if I don't feel it, I don't need to participate in it. But how would you, wh wh what are the flags that, ah, uh, uh, this is very spicy, dodgy. What are the flags? You, you know, when, when some of the calls are not really political, I don't want to be uh, in any show just for show, you mm -hmm. know, just for fine art's sake, you know. I, most of my work is about visual activism. Mm. And it, at, in other instances, people don't like my work because it's queer and it has to do with LGBTI, you know, um, content. Mm. And some people will say, oh, we have a problem. We have children, which basically means you are being judged mm. or the work is judged based on the content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So visual activism. Yes. Is that, that's, so you're basically a, a person who uses her art to, to, to protest, to tell a story. Resistance photography del deals with the political content. Mm aiming at educating individuals who might not be aware of mm. what is going on, especially here in South Africa, dealing mm. with the content that speaks to what the constitution, mm. you know, is all about, where you are given the right to express your, your gender, mm. your sexuality, mm. your, all that you, you are. Do you yeah. feel like you have to explain yourself a lot? Um, <laughs> um, I don't really have to explain myself all the time. But when the need comes or when I'm forced to, right. I have to declare and say, hey, yeah. this is the situation, of course. And will, will your art all, always be around activism or will you ever like just, you know, be doing other things like, hey, let me draw a, a field with horses and a garden? Um, there's so much going on in South Africa today and beyond South African borders, especially um, now that the world is facing, you know, homophobia, queerphobia, lesbophobia, and transphobia. Mm. So I can't just divert the focus and just be uh, free a when a, a lot a of my, you know, when a lot of my peers are not free, when a lot of people are being violated. Are being killed. Of course, violated yeah. on a daily basis where we document like crime scenes and then we even go as far as in like documenting funerals of murdered LGBTI mm. people in this country. So there are people who are documenting beautiful photographs. I have to give respect to them. That's their space. And then um, there are other people who are focused on resistance photography of which we kind of like collaborate and work uh, together to ensure that our voices are heard and to say that nobody deserves to be violated, especially in a, in a country that is supposedly democratic. Yeah. Mm. So do you think, because you just said something that, you know, South Africa and the world as a whole, that like this problem is at an all time high and it's at an, it's like at a, you know, it's, it's reaching boiling points. Do, don't you think it's always been like that? It's just that now there's more documentation of it or is it because now, you know, the, the, the you, everyone is just living freely. It's like, I don't care what you think of me. And it's, it seems to be upsetting people. Um, it's been like that, but then uh, the generation that came before us didn't have much equipment and we didn't have platforms in which we could express ourselves, especially as black people. Mm, such as black women. Especially as black female beings in different spaces. Mm. You had like fewer women in the media prior to 94. Mm. You had fewer black females in different uh, fields uh, before 94. It's still happening in different spaces. But then we are at a space uh, in South Africa where women are coming out in different ways and they are taking on, you know, those positions that were not um, mm -hmm. open to, to, to most of us, mm -hmm. especially in the media, for instance. Mm -hmm. So speaking as a visual activist then like questioning why is like that and thinking of what is going on at home in South Africa, how many protests do you have per year and how many of them have to do with women's rights where they are 
violated on a daily and basis. And also how many then, then are listened to then? Like after the protest, what's the action? Um, action, action is something else. Yeah. That's for another day. But for, for me and my team, the collective mm -hmm. that I formed, which is called Inganiso, what we do or what I have decided to do was, is to distribute cameras and give it to females and let them document what is happening in their mm -hmm. spaces. And we also train people to become the next generation of uh, female photographers. Yeah. And we have achieved that, so looking at the current exhibition that mm -hmm. is at the Old Women's Jail uh, at Constitution Hill. I curated the show, and all the people who are on show are young South Africans who have to do with uh, what is going on here. And they're taking on, you know. So it's at the Constitution Hill until when? Um, the show is on at Constitution Hill, Old Women's Jail, until the 8th of September. Okay. Yeah. Moholi, thank you so much for your time. Constitution Hill, until the 8th of September, at the Old Women's Jail. Make sure you go and check it out. Our last installment today is highlighting some young people doing really awesome things, innovating things. Let's meet Nele Ngolise. My name is Nele Ngolise, and I'm the innovator of Nene Prosthesis. Nelly Colise is a mechanical engineering technologist. She's also the 2017 winner of the Presidential Award and the National Youth Development Agency Award in the Science, Technology and Innovation category. Two years ago, she launched iMedTech, a medical prosthesis design and manufacturing company making custom breast forms for people who have undergone mastectomy due to breast cancer. The idea comes from my master's research. I was doing uh, the applications of additive manufacturing in external facial prosthesis. But then I realized that there's a strong business case in doing breast prosthesis because a whole lot of women are affected by breast cancer and undergo mastectomy and would require breast prosthesis. What makes it different is what's normally in the South African market is you find that a lot of prosthesis have a need of gel like silicone, uh, one that you can easily um, use something sharp and the silicone gel just pops out. So this one is made of medical grade silicone, it's longer lasting. And on top of that, we are able to use color matching devices to match the patient's skin color to that of the prosthesis. This 28-year-old innovator is originally from Tabanju in the Free State and is completing her Master's in Mechanical Engineering at Central University of Technology and currently runs her business between Johannesburg and Pretoria. Um, we had figured out in the past how prosthesis were normally manufactured was that it needed someone with um, high skills of sculpting. Using additive manufacturing and 3D design technologies, you can usually use techniques such as 3D scanning to scan a patient, a person's ear part of the body, external feature on the body, and from there, you can create a 3D model, which is just a model on the computer, and using that 3D model on the computer, you can uh, transfer it to a 3D printer to create a mold. Winning one of um, the top female innovator at the World Economic Forum 2016 was, it still stands out as the biggest award I've ever received in my life thus far, <laughs> because um, you'd understand that the World Economic Forum is a platform that speaks a lot about African development. And to have your work being recognized at that platform is a huge achievement. And uh, more than that, it has allowed me to become part of African development story, which is something I've always looked up to ever since growing up. I Made Tech is now preparing for the launch of its first brace post thesis product called Nain Gold Range. The biggest campaign that we are about to launch is the 1000 Breast Post Thesis, um, which is to say that we're raising funds to have our products distributed to women around South Africa who cannot afford our products. And more than that, we want to make breast prosthesis easily accessible. So it's just about packaging them and making them easily accessible to anyone anywhere in the country. She's also co-founder of Likwebe Innovation Consultants, an umbrella company of iMade Tech, which aims at achieving sustainable development goals in Africa. Our main focus particularly is in healthcare, and we're trying to create a models on health, using technology to advance healthcare, easy access to healthcare, and quality products that advance healthcare and better the lives of 
ordinary people. What I love about South Africa in the past few years since we have been devoted to innovation and development and of entrepreneurship is that there's been a lot of growth of an establishment of incubators that guide people, whether you're from university or you're not from university. If you have brilliant ideas, you are able to be incubated and guided into that journey of bringing your idea into life. Nelly also nabbed second prize in the technology and finance category of the 2016 Social Enterprise Challenge in the Free State, having invented Minute Words, an easy to play word game for all ages. It's easy to see why she is described as a socially conscious leader and devoted entrepreneur. Uh, a person by the time they're adults, they know 20,000 words, but funny enough, people have become too lazy over the years and just use um, close to about 800 words per day and so Minet Words helps people to just advance their word vocabulary by just creating as many words as possible in one minute giving six consonants and three vowels. The three words are always um, sum up my success and uh, it has to do with discipline because I've forever been disciplined to my goals and the other one is uh, about being driven because um, there are times when I just had to push myself beyond the edge of the cliff and say I'm just going to jump and also being devoted to what I'm doing. I feel it's a calling more than anything and this is a calling I've always been devoted to. You will be seeing more of these young innovators thanks to the Department of Science and Technology ensuring that talents and great minds like these are given the tools to shine. So listen, that show once again is at Constitution Hill at the Old Women's Jail. It's up until the 8th of September. Make sure that you go and see Moholi's exhibition out. Join me again tomorrow for another exciting episode of Real Talk. This has been about excellence. Good night.